This is the voice of Bold Business Radio, and I'm your host, Jess Duell of Red Direction. You are listening to Strategy and Technology. I put this program together because I have been hearing my clients talk about the need for technology, not understanding the benefit that it can actually have, and this underlying aversion to what we need to know. Now, even when we are technologically savvy, we are providing services that will be online, SaaS, plugins, apps, you name it. There's still an element of business strategy around technology that we tend to piece together. We cobble it the best that we can when we need it, even though we're very diligent with technology in other parts of our business. So I brought in Greg Michaels and Michael Daniels to talk about this with me. And they're gonna answer this question. What is the top technology issue you see business leaders overlook that make their business strategies less effective? Now, before you meet them, I would like to introduce them both to you. Greg Michaels has a long and successful track record of providing computer repair, networking, and software development services to home and business customers. His company understands what it takes to work with you, regardless of your expertise. And Michael Daniels has worked in, in the restaurant and the construction industries most of his life. He started using computers and turned it into a hobby. And ever since uh, that started way back in 1988, he has been hooked and he figures out ways to share and educate people using technology in addition to implementing it for training within his company. We will be right back after this. Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business, the show that provides everything smart leaders need to evaluate situations, build relationships, and create solutions. Jessica Duo candidly talks about the skills necessary to build tenacity and do more with less. And now, here's Jessica. Okay, Greg, what is the top technology issue that you see business leaders overlook that makes their business strategy less effective? Well, at a high level, I would say is that they really don't have a strategy. So that would be a problem. Um, if you want to get kind of deeper in the weeds, the biggest challenge or problem I see most businesses running into is this very simple thing of not having a good, reliable backup system. Square one or step one of any kind of strategy is to protect your intellectual property and your data. A few statistics, 50% of hard drives are gonna fail in five years. 75% of us don't have a reliable backup. So if you do a little math there, about 40% of us are a crisis waiting to happen. And you don't know how many people that come to my shop and say, well, my computer is dead, but would you please save my data? Because that is the most important thing here. I don't care about the computer. And that's great, but obviously if you cared, you would have had a plan. And you would be surprised that no matter what level of business, whether it's just a home user all the way up through, printing companies lose 20 years of customer logos because they didn't have a backup. So how strategic was that? Not really, right? So you got to ask yourself, if a hurricane came along and wiped out my office or a fire or a flood or thieves or whatever, could I recover? Could I open up tomorrow and have everything I need to continue uninterrupted with my business? And most people I would have to say would say probably not. And then they have to think about this other thing, which is what happened to me, which is I had a backup. I had a backup system. And what about when my backup system fails, which was a little bit of an eye opener too. So I have firsthand experience on many levels. We could make a whole nother topic of just talking about how to do backups. I don't think many businesses do have a coherent strategy, whether it's a maintenance strategy, an upgrade strategy, a backup strategy, or even a strategy of managing their personnel. I just don't think businesses want to think about it or deal with it. They're just too worried about running the business and they know they got to have computers to get their work done but they're not thinking about, well, what's gonna happen five years from now or 
what's going to happen if I have a, um, let's say, a disgruntled employee leave and he has all the knowledge of my entire company in his head? Things like that. I don't think people think about it until it happens. Michael, I want to know what's the top technology issue you see the business leaders overlook that make their business strategy less effective? I think you know me, a video is so huge to me and that collaboration that you get and what video gives you, even from a standpoint of the usefulness and the technology behind that. And I think that they lose that connection with the people. I'm in the construction business. So in our business, we actually All of our employees know how to use it. We use it at every job if we have to talk to one another and use the like a video call or something like that. There's something about that that, as opposed to just communicating through a text and people don't utilize that technology. And we also use video for doing interviews. I've talked in some staffing companies that we use to get people. It saves the employees time and money and the technology that's out there and the cloud. I mean, he brought up a great point. I have everything in the cloud backed up three times over. So it's not even an issue. I actually had that happen. We had a computer at work with all of our books and luckily we had a backup of every single thing and it was perfect. I totally agree with what Greg mentions because I think people just take for granted that it's not gonna happen to me or it's okay or that kind of thing. So all in all, I would say those two things are really important. Having that insurance, the backup or the video, being able to use that technology, I think it holds people back and how much more they can. Because people, to me in business, it's a relationship. There's so many competitive parts of everybody's business. Everybody has a competitor. If I can make that relationship, and I think that helps that, the video part is huge to me. And that's why you see me all the time. We're here right now, now that kind of thing. So, And this is why I chose the two of you to come on. We have an enthusiast who says, yes, here's how we can use technology to be the best at what we do. And then we have our authority of, this is all I do every day. I save people's butts. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to think about the two ends of the spectrum because most people are somewhere in the middle. And and in fact, there are a lot of people who listen to this program, guys, that aren't even on this spectrum. They're like, what the heck do I need technology for at all? I hate my email. So there. I don't even want to text you while I'm at work because it's a distraction. Well, I'd rather be distracted than go on Facebook. So maybe that's okay is what they're thinking to themselves. Who knows? With those two answers and the setup of the perspectives that you're coming from, when we are in our work and when we're looking at technology, how can we look at our technology with I don't want to say new eyes because that's really not it. How could we make sure that we're using the technology that we have in its most efficient form that actually helps us do us better to do a better job? I don't think anybody's out there in the small business world actually seeking out what's the best for them. They're just kind of going along. If you did have a strategy, you would be uh, out there looking at what are the new technologies coming out? How can I leverage them? In my business, video is certainly the direction everybody is going. So if you're not dealing in video, then you're behind the eight ball already. Those kinds of assessments should be going on continuously during the life cycle of your business to, to give you that edge up on your competition. But if you're not out there seeking it, then you're never going to really know. The key is, is how you go about, you know, you said a lot of people don't know about this or they don't know how to go about this. The biggest thing is exposing it out there. Like I said, I went to those companies and said, here's the way I want to do it. It's going to save you money. It's going to save me money. Here's how. I am also bilingual in Spanish. So when I teach language, I don't teach it like the school books because that's not the way you learn it. I have a brand new grandbaby. She's learning a whole new language. How she's learning is basically by listening and soaking in everything she can or in experimenting. It doesn't matter how elementary it is. You've got to start with that process and you got to teach it. So when you put all that out there, video and things like that, people are going to be overwhelmed by that. I'm going to bring it right back to the way I started, training and teaching and how you do that is the key. That's the key to getting it all going. Yes, I don't know about you, Mike, but I find myself always training people when I'm fixing their problems. I'm also trying to educate them 
what they should be doing so that this stuff doesn't happen again or whatever. And it helps to add the part of why. Sometimes when you, instead of just saying, hey, this is the way to do it, if you say, this is why we do this because it hasn't worked like this in the past. Now they're bought into it. They say, oh, well, have you ever tried this? That's the best. That's the best result you can get because now they're teaching you. As a teacher, you have to be open to being taught. To me, that's huge. It has to be a two-way street. We're human. That's human nature. I think when we were cavemen, <laughs> they saw a dinosaur, you know, and we got to figure out how to get this boulder and knock this guy out. One guy couldn't do it. They had to do it together. So, I mean, it's, and that sounds very kind of very rudimentary there, but, <laughs> but I think it's human nature. I just think it's human nature. And you guys are talking from a perspective of curiosity and learning and openness already. How do you engage somebody? And, you know, by the way, this could be one of the leaders listening who's like, I just delegate all that stuff. Or somebody who goes, I see the benefit, just leave me out of it. Or something like that. So there's an avoidance. What would you recommend to us that we do? Because we just have a fear around this unknown and technology is just extra scary. That's a tough question, but we like to say there is no such thing as a dumb question. And when I talk to people, I usually treat them as if they don't know anything. So I have to start from the basic and work my way up. And you could tell in a conversation pretty quick how much they know and how simple you need to keep things. But to just make them comfortable that, you know, I'm not going to call you stupid if you don't know what you're talking about because that's not the point. The point is to help you out with your technology issues. So could we send you an email and say, you know, I don't want to look stupid in front of my people. Can you fill me in? Sure. But if you don't have the person at the top that's going to buy into the technology, then it's not going to work. All the way around. All the way around. Yeah. Uh, they have to be committed all the way through the organization if you're going to make some of these things work. Because, of course, if you're bringing in new technology, even the employees may be resisting that right. uh, change because nobody likes change. There's buy-in and then there's actually buy-in. So I can see a department or an executive team going, yes, we need this technology and we make this decision. And you're right. If they really don't buy in and it's really not clear the reason they're doing what they're doing, it's going to be harder to get change throughout the organization. I hear what you're saying on that point, And I think that's really important. And so in some cases where our enthusiasm is and the people that are in our organizations that love this stuff, that get excited about learning, couldn't they become like a confidant of ours that we could be more transparent and say, can you tell me more about this? I'd like to learn, or will you show me how to do this or call Greg <laughs> <laughs> or really call Michael too, because both of you, what I know of you, just the goodness that you have, you're like, I can work with you on that or I can't, but I know who does. Sometimes that's a lot of it too, is just having the people like, like you mentioned it starting off the guy that delegates. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. If you don't have that ability, make sure you have the people that do have the ability. That's what I do. Surround yourself with great people. I remember a, a story about Henry Ford a long time ago. He was in court. He said right to the judge, he turned to the judge. He says, I have no idea, but you know what? I pay a lot of people that do know. Let's see if I can get the answer for you. You know, that's a big deal. And you talk about fear, fear. You know what? Fear is part of life. It's part of what we do. Every single thing, even in sport, I use baseball's analogy because I'm a coach. That guy is so intimidating as a pitcher. Yeah. But you know what? He's not perfect. <laughs> baseball is a game of failure. There's fear, failure, all that in there. So you have to overcome those things. And I think one of the biggest ways and the biggest things that you can do is put yourself in their shoes. I think of that same thing. If it's freezing cold out or whatever your temperature is and you're out there pitching, Put yourself in their shoes. How would you do? Remember the times when you were a beginner. I do that in our business all the time. I do that with my wife. She's not great with computers and stuff, and she has trouble. I'm just saying, she, she has trouble with it, and she's just like, oh, my gosh, I just, you made me think of it when you said, I, don't, I can't stand this email. It's not doing what I want it to do, or I can't, you know, print. I can't print, or I can't copy, you know, or something like that. I, I never say this. I learned this a long time ago. Don't say that's easy because you know what? It might be easy to you, but someone who doesn't know or knew, they don't have that same 
thought process like that. But then if she goes in and bakes a cake or biscuits, because I cannot bake, and she says it's easy, I say, hey, let's reverse this. You can't say that because I don't do well with that. I just don't. That's just something that I can't grasp. So anybody that can help me out there, I'd appreciate that. You want to look me up? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, technology is one of those things where I still will cry and throw a tantrum like a three-year-old when it does not work. I don't know why. Maybe it's because most of my life I've used technology. So when it doesn't work and it's supposed to, I get extra frustrated. And or if I need to be shown what to do, the person who's asking me can feel this thing emanating off of me and they take it personally and I'm like it's really not you I'm just mad at myself because I can't do this and then I'll cry and I laugh because this is what I do this radio show is all technology the things that I do in business to connect with business owners around the United States this is what I do we use technology but there are still times I will be honest and say, I throw a tantrum when it comes to technology. So when I ask some of these questions and you hear some of these things, anybody who's relating to this, just know you're not alone. <laughs> not alone. Hello. <laughs> I think we've all been there. And I always like to say, I miss those old big clunky CRT monitors because when I used to get frustrated, I used to smack them a lot and they could handle it. <laughs> and now if I smack my monitor, it'd probably fly across the room. <laughs> Yeah, don't don't hit your camera, please. We already dealt with that. Once. <laughs> <laughs> Just play it. But as far as overcoming the fear, I think part of that also has to do with uh, trust. And I, yeah. there's almost everybody I run into has had a bad experience with a technology person that has given them bad advice at some point along the way. So they, you walk in with people thinking they're skeptical to to begin with. So you have to overcome the trust factor as well to break down the fear. And technology is a requirement of business today. One of the things that I've been hearing more and more is that kids that are in school, the kids that are going through college, in addition to writing and math and being able to read this concept of some sort and some level of programming is also now a requirement. Whether we know it or not, we program our phones, even though it looks really easy where you get to press the button and then you drag everything where you want, or you're dragging everything around your computer where you want to get it organized. It's still a type of programming, even though that's like the most elementary level, if you will, the least involved. When we don't know how to use technology from the get-go, when we don't understand how to manipulate it, and I'm going to use the word manipulate to get it to do what we want, because it doesn't do what we want right now, becomes a valuable asset. And more and more technologies that we use actually allow that to occur, this concept of open source, where we can get what we need and we can see the work of other people, and we do have a community and a two-way street. I don't know where Greg's mind goes, but when I hear open source, I hear threat. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I hear open source, I hear free. <laughs> and free is good. And, but there's also this concept of threat because when you're building on open source, one of the things that you also said, Greg, was IP, intellectual property. What are some of those things? And when we make those choices, are we clear about them? So we are making choices in our business every day using technology and deciding to rely on technology. And do we understand what that underlying piece is? And one of the things that you said at the beginning, Greg, you were talking about the fact that technology is just not part of the overall business strategy, typically, unless you're a technology company. And then where does the technology come from? It comes from the thing that's being built not the technology to deploy or to communicate or to some other things. So it's really interesting. And I want to totally focus on productivity here in this piece. Michael, you alluded to this. We just use technology to get connected because it's a two-way street. Well, as an organization, how much do we need to be aware of and I don't want to say control, but shape and provide the avenues for approved technologies so we understand what's on our systems. You said a mouthful right there because there's something about the human part of it and technology gives you that opportunity. And that's the part, if you remember at the very beginning that I said that I don't think that we use enough. We don't get that out there. We don't, we don't take advantage of that part of it. 
you can provide all this technology and all this kind of stuff, but they could be less productive. They could actually be less productive in the job and the tasks that you're trying to do. So it becomes so important to use that along with the skill sets of whatever the productivity. Like I said, we're in construction, but we put floors down. If they're sitting there working, trying to figure out how to do this on their phone or how to do that, it has to be that, again, back to the teaching and and that part, is making sure that it's taught that, hey, look, we do want you to use these tools. We do want the technology. We have to have the technology. It's making things easier. And this goes way back before we had technology. I was in the restaurant business for many years. We always did a schedule. You've always heard of doing a schedule. People still have schedules. People have calendars, okay? We always had a schedule. That was the plan. Did it change? Absolutely it changed. But you have to do a little bit of that technological part first in order for this to get done. That's the way I approach that too. You know, hey, look, this is great. I'm giving these tools. I don't expect you to be there on the job sitting there doing this. And there's no floor done yet. So, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Employers need to have some guidelines for their employees about the use of the technology. But recognize that there is a liability on the employer side with their intellectual property as, as well as just general liability. It's great to have people having all this access to this technology, but what if they're abusing your technology? Like you said, they're on their phone instead of working on the floor. Mm-hmm or they're on Facebook all day when they're supposed to be scheduling patients or whatever it happens to be. That's another thing under the umbrella of strategy is what's your personnel strategy? Do you have a computer policy, let's say, for your employees that has simple things like, hey, don't go surfing porn sites. Don't steal my customer list. That's intellectual property. You can't really have access to that. And I bring these up because I've seen these things happen. Yes, there's technology and you want people to leverage it for productivity, but you also have to protect yourself against abuse. And I've been on two sides of this in a slightly different venue. My first company was a technology company. It was e-commerce. And what we found was not only did our target audience of software developers use this technology the way that it was as a primary source uh, connected to their business to make commerce happen, we also had companies, very large companies, run test programs using our commerce system because it was too hard or there was too much bureaucracy or there was too much of this other stuff and they needed to find a working prototype and find out if whatever they were building could be sold before they took it to the next step. And so the technology company that I ran became a part of this sandbox or this playground for some companies. And then of course, all of a sudden these companies start getting checks from me and my company. And they're like, who are you? What are you doing? And by the way, they were never really like that, but that was the essence and the urgency. (laughs) And we would have to go backwards and work and find the team within their organization that had created a relationship with us to do this project to see if it would work. And most of the time, those turned into long-term relationships because it turned out we were cheaper, better, faster, which was the whole purpose of what we were doing. The productivity Um, we were talking about, exactly. The productivity became essential for them, yeah. Exactly. And then you flip it around. I had employees, and I still do, depending on each stage of the game, where there's going to be a tool out there that they love, that they're enthusiastic about, that they like, and it's going to make them more productive. They install it on the network of the company and enough other people think that this is really a good tool and it creates productivity. Maybe it creates two-way communication and it's outside of this realm of what has been approved, if you will, because maybe this is the next evolution, the iteration for overall improvement in process, profitability, and other things. So being able to look back and go, not all technology that we're banning is bad. We just don't know about it. So how do we circle back? How do you filter those too? Yeah. Because you may may be working on something and it does not work. So there's a filter process there too, So, so which is good. All through history, we learn, and you ask anybody, anybody that's successful, they made lots of mistakes. 
lots of mistakes along the way. That's how I get along with it. It's, it's awesome. It's so great teaching Spanish and stuff to kids because they're so frustrated. They're like, oh my God, I'm, not, I'm never going to get this. You will, but you have to make mistakes. This is to tell you when I was learning Spanish, I told this guy, I said, tu eres un hombro muy amable. I told him that he was a kind shoulder. I said hombro instead of hombre. I meant to say man, but I said shoulder. You have to be willing to have some fun and make some mistakes. You, you have to, yeah. but that's what helps you progress more by making those mistakes. It's just, I mean, it's just awesome. What would you add to that, Greg? Hey, I used to be a software developer. I would go meet with what we used to call them the end users, which is kind of a dirty word, and say, well, what do you want? And uh, they would tell you, and you'd go off in your little cube and you'd build it. And you bring it back to them and show it to them. And the first thing they do is start clicking all over the place where you never expected them to ever click. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, why are you doing that? I would have never considered that. But in the end, I end up going back and now redoing it to fit their modus operandi. So yes, technology, I guess it comes back again to training. Yeah, I was just going to say, to just to tie to that, exactly what you're saying. I think of my mother, you know, who's 74 years old. She's trying to learn to use a smartphone. A lot of times she hands it to her teenage granddaughter or daughter. And I'm just like, no, no, wait, wait just a second. You got to, this is how you learn. You got to, you know, so, so exactly what you just said, the development has to come from within. You have to have that drive and want to do it too, though. I think that has to be there. And I think a lot of times people stop when they get to a certain level and they say, okay, I'm functional now with this, so I'm good and they don't ever go the next step. How else can I get better at this? Or what other features are here? What other processes I can employ to do this better? They're just happy to, okay, yeah, here, here's your tool. Here's how you get through it. And once they've gotten through it, they're all good. That's where they stop. They stop <laughs> learning, which we know about learning in life. And I think the same is true for technology, eh? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to know what most excites you about the technologies that are emerging today that we think are going to be on tap for us tomorrow and the next day and in the next five or 10 years. Everybody's talking about video being important these days, but probably what's more exciting to me is the expansion of technology just beyond the desktop computer or the laptop, the uh, application of technology to everything else, including even the um, human anatomy. I mean, we're at the point now where we're putting chips in people's brains to fight Alzheimer's and things like that. I don't know if you call this exciting, but you watch all these sci-fi shows or movies about people integrating technology into their bodies. And I think we are definitely heading that way. There's already companies putting RF transmitters in your wrist to open doors and to buy food at the cafeteria and ridiculous things. And it's like, where is this all going? We're at a scary point right now. Where is this going to go? Of course, how are the bad guys going to take advantage of this stuff? On one level, it's very exciting about all the ways we can leverage it, but at the same time, very, very scary. The other thing is, uh, I think people need to at some point step away from the technology and go back to being just human beings and interacting on that level. Nowadays, you hear a lot about the up and coming generations. Well, yes, they're great with technology, but they can't have a conversation with the customer to save their lives. And you can't embrace technology to the point where it takes over and consumes your existence. You still need to be a personal person, a literate person. Um, even the CIA is having trouble finding good spies because to be a good spy, you've got to make friends and win over their confidence and things like that. And, and they're saying, wow, this younger generation have no clues. Yes, we want to embrace technology, but we don't want to sacrifice our humanity in the process. Which is why I bring back video, because video, I visually see your emotions when you're talking to me. And that's why I think so much, I, I know I keep going back to it, but I'm a real nerd when it comes to video and trying to do things and stuff like that. But I think there's that human part of it. If I'm talking to somebody on the phone, even if I can talk to them and see the motions that they're using and see that they're frustrated, I think I can help them more. And, and doing things together is a huge thing. So I, that's why I'm saying the collaboration, even Google went to it with their Google Drive and their docs where people are collaborating. In school, we always took a test. When I was in school, we always took a test by ourselves. We never took a test with somebody. 
when I was teaching Spanish, I said, okay, the whole class, we're going to, everybody, you all have to pass the test together. Every one of us, we all have to get this because that's what we do at work. We brainstorm till we come up with the right answer. If we're having an issue, we get the guys that are doing it. We get the guys above and we get the people in the middle. We put all that together. You have to have that part of it. So that has to be a part of all aspects of technology, in my opinion. We're down to the ultimate part of this show where we tie back to the title, the voice of bold business. I want to know from each of you, why is it bold to be thinking about technology as part of a strategy, thinking about technology as part of uh, connection and how it changes business today when we embrace it? Well, I think that's pretty simple. If you're the person who is bold and you embrace it, then you might be the one with the leg up on your competition. So do you want to be on that side or on the other side who's just trying to keep up and get through the day? You want to be bold. You also want to be smart. I heard a phrase recently that I liked. It was technology with oversight. We want to embrace the technology, but you, there should be some oversight there. And yeah, you want to leverage it to the advantage of your business over the next guy who's not being bold and reaching out for those uh, new solutions. I'm going to have to go first here next time because he keeps answering these really darn well. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. No, it's all right. It leaves me nothing to say. No. <laughs> we can't lose the aspect. We're all dealing with other people. It has to be that. I know I've said it a numerous times, but it's collaboration. It's the people part. You talk about why. Is it bold? That's it. It has to start there and end there, in my opinion. Okay, I tell you what, Greg and Michael, two amazing gentlemen with different perspectives of using technology and both really setting in and looking with me at this concept of technology, the fear around it, the fact that it belongs as part of a strategy instead of this necessary evil, if you will, that we use every day. And I think it's really important. I think it's important because, you know, we're talking about protecting intellectual property. We're talking about being as connected as we can. We're talking about having backups so that when catastrophe occurs, we can keep picking up with the least amount of downtime as a business as possible. I mean, think about it. What if your phone system goes down? Or what if you're meaning your internet these days? What if your technology crashes in some capacity? Or there is some other natural disaster that comes into play? The more comfortable we are with the technology we're using and the more we understand the reasons for it, the more excited each person within our organization can get. They can get to the point of being able to do it, do what they need to do and do it well. They can get to the point where they'll see something else that might make them more productive, which allows us as leaders in business where we're talking about these things to have a place and figure out what technology doesn't work for the company and the organization anymore and what technologies are our people using that we can learn from and institute to benefit everybody on our teams. You will find all of the program notes at voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P124. That is voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P for program 124. You can also search strategy and technology. Make sure to subscribe and rate the Voice of Bold Business Radio on your preferred listening platform and know that you can find this program anywhere podcasts are sold. Share your story and experience to add to this conversation about what it means to be an effective leader in your role right now. It's all about how we integrate strategy and technology. Subscribe at thevoiceofboldbusiness.com and get more information, program notes, and past episodes. Bold leaders approach each situation and focus on action to achieve a higher level of leadership. Jessica Duell, your business advocate, is the host of the Voice of Bold Business Radio. Thank you for joining us.